Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, ako po si Clarissa David. I'm a professor at the College of Mass Communication, University of the Philippines. Uh, this talk, hello, Rappler. This talk uh, was delivered as part of a brown bag, academic brown bag seminar in the University of the Philippines College of Masscom with a few of my colleagues there. So I'll be delivering the same talk here. I, I'm talking about fake news and the dilemma that it has created for us as a democratic society. It's an issue that's been of growing concern of the last two years. Maybe a little bit further than that, but in the last two years, it has clearly escalated to a scale that is difficult to manage. It's not a new phenomenon to, unique to our digital age. Misinformation and disinformation through media has been around for many years. The difference today is that we're dealing with an information ecosystem that allows for faster spread of information and many barriers to any corrective measures to correct that misinformation. In the midst of responses by industry, by government, and civil society, the academe must carve out its role and contribute to the search for solutions. This presentation attempts to articulate the various types of content we're concerned about when we talk about fake news. I focus on the inordinate role that Facebook has played in the spread of fake news and the various means by which we can contribute to stemming the tide of disinformation. The term fake news has been used as a catch-all for many kinds of objectionable content. These are some examples, and I submit that many of these are not really fake news, and it is counterproductive, in fact, to even use the term. Misleading or sensationalized stories that rest on factual information interpreted in a particular way is not necessarily fake. Bad parody or satire can easily be mistaken for news, but it is not at all news. Bad or sloppy reporting is not really fake and is often unintentional in its effect to mislead. The really problematic kinds of content are intentionally deceptive messages, which no journalist would classify as news. Hyperpartisan opinion pieces or blogs that function as propaganda, and the only one of these which is strictly speaking, which strictly speaking qualifies as fake news, is manufactured information or fake information. Manufactured information is the core of the problem. But it's not the only problem, and it's by no means the most important problem that led to the toxic and polluted state of our political information environment. To call all of these fake news, and then to seek to regulate it, is a dangerous proposition. The proverbial slippery slope. Let's take a closer look at these things first and think about the main enablers of the phenomenon. When we are willing to call all of this fake news, we open the floodgates to include under its definition even real news. When you can't tell the difference between news and opinion, it becomes a problem. When you can't tell if a story is satire or posted on a fake website pretending to be a real news channel or that it's in fact an opinion columnist's piece in a legitimate news organization space, then proceed to label all of them fake news as if they were all the same thing, that's a problem. These are not all the same thing. When you start calling for penalties on fake news, then categorize political memes or political blogs alongside fake news, then we are in danger of restricting free speech and free press. The lines are blurred. The lines hardly exist at all. Which one of these is news? Which ones are opinion? Which ones are lobby group memes? A study last year of the total Facebook engagements for the top 20 U.S. election stories shows that fake news has become much more successful in virality and engagement than mainstream news. And that's in the U.S. It could be worse here. Fakeness of news, like many other things, is in the eyes of the beholder. The facts may be the same, but the interpretations are vastly different. Both sides will call the other fake news. Hyperpartisan political blogs, Facebook accounts, and websites are attacking legacy news media, calling them fake news. It's a tactic, and it has enjoyed some success. This is an example of the same event framed with two interpretations. Alan Peter Cayetano's interview in Al Jazeera, where he was confronted by the interviewer about his claim that over 3,500 people killed were all drug dealers. On the left is a graphic from Rappler, on the right is a graphic from a hyperpartisan blog on Facebook. No information, strictly speaking, is fake. The difference is in interpretation and presentation. 
on top of on top of this photo when you see it on Facebook they have a narrative of how Alan Peter Cayetano supposedly won this debate so it frames the interpretation even though technically speaking there is no fake information there the project is to discredit news outfits it's part of a larger effort to undermine legitimate news organizations and while this is a global phenomenon our market in the Philippines has characteristics that make it especially vulnerable. We've had a weak history in news. It's a relatively young and currently struggling industry. Compared to developed countries, newspaper readership has been historically low when measured as a percentage of the population that reads broadsheets, broadsheet newspapers every day. While overall, trust of the media in 2017 was relatively high at 78%, it's lower among those who use social media. Moreover, sentiment analysis of social media chatter about traditional media are overwhelmingly negative. On social media, legitimate news outfits are being attacked and discredited. Whether orchestrated or organic, at this stage is no longer relevant. It's here and it needs to be addressed. We can't talk about disinformation and misinformation without talking about Facebook the main platform through which all of this content is being created and delivered. It's our curator of information. Social media is the necessary distribution mechanism for these campaigns. Discussed in a recent story in the New York Times, and I quote, the platform allows misinformation to find receptive audiences. Those are audiences who have biases for agreeable information, emotionally charged, highly polarizing content. It has facilitated the blurring of the lines between news and everything else. Fake news, real news, and everything in between. Sharing of disinformation on the platform is easy, and it has no consequence for the person sharing it. Facebook is also the site of this struggle. The bullying of facts out of online spaces. They come in different forms, personal attacks and straight-out threats as a way of making legitimate news outfits appear illegitimate. The privileging of citizen journalists over professional journalists by attacking the entire enterprise of news. These are all means of silencing dissent. Then we have the unique problem of when the official sources are lying. Is it fake news when the reporter is directly quoting the words of an official source? This is new territory for journalists, when official sources will routinely lie. Publishing unverified statements of official sources under the banner of legitimate news can have some of the worst effects. Since they are carried by news sources, they have an added layer of believability. It is most dangerous when the lie is quoted without question in the headline, when we all know that people, the vast majority of people, are not likely to read the text to find out if these are corroborated with facts within the main story. News organizations have to rethink how they handle these scenarios of official sources lying. Either don't write it, even for its shock value, or verify it, and if it is indeed manufactured information, say it in the headline. These are some of the examples from the New York Times. They started calling out Trump's lying in the headlines. When you see it on Facebook, you will see it in the headline when, um, when Trump says something that is untrue. And they've kept doing it, and many other news sources internationally have adopted the practice. An important defining feature of problematic content is intent. Disinformation is the bigger problem than misinformation. Disinformation should be met with aggressive resistance. Disinformation is designed to mislead. It is purposely spreading in a strategic way to persuade. Misinformation, on the other hand, is fueled mostly by ignorance and not by malice. These days, we have both. At the source and initial spread, it could be it is disinformation. But the wider it spreads, the sharing is no longer intention, intentional. It is people genuinely believing they're spreading the truth. This example is kind of the opposite. It started out as a supposedly satire post from a site called okdito.com. Then it was picked up by various hyperpartisan blog sites and Facebook accounts. Within hours, it took on a life of its own. Comments on these posts indicate that most readers believed it. So even if the intention was not to mislead, the effect was to mislead. In sum, the, fake, the term fake news is problematic. It's been subverted, subsuming all manner of objectionable content 
under the general term of fake news, then seeking to regulate it can be dangerous. We will end up in censorship territory. There are two processes at play here, content generation and dissemination. In the Senate hearings, we saw the content producers, the bloggers and influencers who run Facebook pages and groups. If we focus only on that, we will be limited to punitive measures against the content producers. What we haven't been talking about is the second half of this problem, the distribution side or the social media platform. Around 50% of Filipinos are on Facebook. This is a conservative estimate, especially considering new users that have been brought on through Facebook Basic, the free version that gives news audiences a different, limited experience. The 2016 election campaign drove political discourse online, almost exclusively on social media, and online audiences in this country relied heavily on Facebook for news. In turn, legacy news organizations or legitimate news organizations relied on Facebook for audiences. I paraphrased from a piece that was published um, in Snopes sometime last year, now that content is free and ubiquitous, we live in an attention economy. Public attention is finite and it's valuable. With a vast expansion of choice that floods our Facebook news feed, legitimate journalism is crowded out by everything else. The signal is drowned out by the noise. Legitimate journalism becomes hard to find, hard to recognize, and the news has an increasingly difficult time finding its audience. That we rely on Facebook for our news reading creates additional layers of complexity to this dilemma. Experimental research has found that when we read on a smartphone, we pay less attention, engage less with the content, and have lower knowledge transfer. Furthermore, especially with Facebook, there are higher levels of emotional response, more negative response than positive, which in turn leads to more polarized opinions. Problematic content spreads more easily on Facebook because these are shared by trusted friends. The news feed is agnostic to brand. It makes no distinction between news and opinion, and the whole ecosystem is rigged to encourage liking, commenting, and reposting. That famous echo chamber is real, created by algorithm and engagement-driven Facebook platform. It's human nature, it's how social beings act, surrounding themselves with like-minded others and avoiding disagreeing opinion and information. Social media have just made it automated, commercialized, and subsequently and naturally, you have groups that will game the system. Facebook is our main curator of information, and the biggest problem in the Philippines, specifically, is that we have very few other sources of news. Very few people read the newspaper, a lot of people watch television, few people read, um, listen to radio. So the alternatives to Facebook as a news source is limited. Facebook learns what you agree with based on your engagement metrics. It then feeds you more opinion-reinforcing content. Eventually, you only see content that agrees with you. Humans are predisposed to protect their beliefs, especially when these align with personal biases. So once a belief in a story sets in, changing that belief is very difficult. The direct attacks on fake stories with real stories can potentially lead to a backfire effect where people who were exposed to fake stories and believe fake information dig in deeper and then these beliefs in fake information crystallize. This system is made worse by appeals to extreme negative emotion. The attention economy incentivizes the creation of content designed to anger readers. We are humans and this is how humans react. We are more likely to share, to react, to engage when we're angered. Negative emotions are more likely to create engagement than positive emotions. There's also the fact that you have these addictive feedback loops or the swipe down to refresh sort of um, addictive behavior on Facebook where you don't know what you're going to get, so you just keep reading and reading and reading and reading. And before you know it, you've spent many hours on Facebook on a typical day. So how does this whole ecosystem work? In the information ecosystem of Facebook, legitimate news publishers will write content. Each story can be interpreted as being against or for one side, depicted here in colored dots. So each yellow dot is a story that can be interpreted to be on one side of uh, politics, and then the red dots depict stories that can be interpreted on another side of politics. There are other possible sources of content. There are hyper-partisan blogs, 
that peddle in bombastic opinion wrapped around the barest of facts. There are also disinformation campaigns. These are not balanced, they're one-sided, but they come from both sides. So you have content generation from both sides of the political aisle. As a Facebook user, the platform reads your preference on each of these two sides based on your history, then selects the stories from all sources that agree with your existing opinion. The news feeds of Facebook users become homogenous, stacked heavily on one side. The diversity of views and stories that legitimate news seeks to generate disappears on the side of the audiences. The effect is this. Ideally, the public should be exposed to diverse opinions and see all sides of all issues, even if they don't want to. But by social media algorithms filtering information into their feeds, the public sees only stories and opinions that agree with their existing views. They get polarized into more divergent and extreme views, and they become angry. In this setup, in the eyes of the news publisher, they're producing a balanced set of stories. But when it gets spread through the Facebook network, they are clustered into homogenous sets and fed to increasingly homogenous audiences. What kind of information environment do we need? If we can fix the platform, how should it work? New stories as they are produced should not be spread in a selective or self-selective way. It should be equally pushed regardless of an individual's current opinion. They should be clearly labeled as verified news pages and accounts, and hyper-partisan blogs and pages that are not legitimate news should be categorized just as paid advertising. They compete with all other paid advertisers. Individual news, news, news feeds would have more balanced sets of stories on a daily basis. People would be more diverse in the opinions they hold, and they won't be extremists. Plus, they'll be less angry. Is it a pipe dream? I don't think so. What is clear is that critical intervention is needed on the side of dissemination. And increasingly, Facebook is starting to realize that they have a role to play in all of this, and that they need to take accountability for the kind of environment their platform enables. There's the additional layer of what happens when it's not a fair fight, when the content from news producers have to compete with content from non-news and then figure out how they're going to get their content to audiences. Often we hear the proposal that the way to fight fake news is with more real news and by enlisting the help of concerned responsible citizens. That would be fine if we are in a fair fight, but we clearly are not. There are participants in this struggle that are bullies, those that resort to violent threats, those that are funded or manipulated. Some of this content are planted and orchestrated, then are later on enabled by the misled, who spread it in an organic way. It's not a fair fight, and we will, we will stand a chance against the tide of fake stuff by seeking ways to level the playing field. The bigger problem is not fake news per se, but the broken information ecosystem that is polluted by disinformation campaigns. The speed at which false information is created and spreads, how can any person possibly run after it to fact check everything? Fact checking is important, but it's not enough. When the information platform makes it difficult for the fact check stories to get to the audience that saw the fake stories, we have to give people tools and cues to sift through the good and bad. Let me quote from a recent article on the Atlantic on the role, of, the role that Facebook plays in the decline of democratic discourse. The goals of newsfeed have nothing to do with democracy. They might overlap sometimes, but they are not the same. Zuckerberg says he wants Facebook to be a force for good in democracy. To recognize that one's massive platform can do good, however, requires an understanding that it could also do bad. You can't have one without the other. This sin of omission runs through Silicon Valley, change the world, have an impact, these are incomplete phrases that render incomplete thoughts. Does maximizing engagement, as it is understood through Newsfeed's automated analysis, create structural problems in the information ecosystem? Perhaps virality and engagement cannot be the basis for a ubiquitous information service that acts as a force for good in democracy." End quote. What is the scenario if the system is not corrected? If the system is not corrected, we have eroded trust in the enterprise of journalism as a whole. It threatens the industry of news and the practice of news work. If that goes and we need real information, who can we then rely on? 
So this is not a concern just for the industry. It's a concern for all citizens. You'll notice that Philippine fake news is almost completely political content. Fake news is very rarely not about politics. The press, on the other hand, has the responsibility to cover everything. They have a responsibility to cover disasters, social issues, civic issues, local events, international news, policy, courts, etc. If fake news is what remains after this, after this fight, then all you have is political news and hyper-partisan political news. Where are you going to get real information about things that affect your daily life? The intervention, I would argue, is in the platform. It's from the top. Intervention is also at the level of the reader through media literacy or news literacy. Intervention is also in the industry. To wean it, journalism needs to learn how it will wean itself away from reliance on Facebook as a dissemination mechanism for news content. What's missing is demand for truthful information. What is very worrisome is the fact that people don't seem to understand that it's important to have truthful information. There has not been a shortage of supply. The problem is a shortage of demand. High choice information environments historically has degraded the demand for truthful information and it's gotten worse now. People enjoy their silos, they enjoy their echo chambers, and they enjoy their bubbles. Until the information they need is immediately critical to their well-being and safety, there is no natural demand for facts. Audiences also need protections from the providers. Reddit recently banned selected subreddits where harassment and hate speech had proliferated to the point where it was being encouraged by participants. What happened? Most of the banned subreddit contributors simply stopped posting on the website altogether, and those who stayed did not take their hate speech elsewhere. So the hate speech that you will see in a lot of threads and comments, people who are in there whip themselves up into a frenzy, and then it escalates into a lot of violence and threatening language. We have to take back these democratic spaces, and it should be done both inside and outside the biggest platforms. The experiments that have been run by some of these platforms illustrate that if you turn if you turn off these subreddits, the hate speech disappears. They don't move to a different subreddit and then be hateful there. You can control the platforms, control the spaces where all of this violence happens. There needs to be intervention by the platform. There needs to be a redistribution of revenue and reach to credible content. And it needs to start with tech companies like Facebook and Google. And this is where Local intervention has to actively engage with the technology companies because they are operating with our populations. They are operating in our space. So we have to figure, we have to have some power in this relationship to tell them to protect our spaces. There are apps out there that carry only legitimate news outlets, vetted media institutions, and they're giving users an alternative platform to read the news. There are plugins that can flag suspicious stories. These are all technologies that are under development. But for all of these to enter widespread use, we have to increase the demand for truthful information. Media literacy at the level of universities, of high schools, and even from elementary schools is something that needs to be aggressively pursued by our educational institutions. Strategic promotion of legitimate news content needs to catch up with what the strategy that's being applied from the other side. And we have to enlist the support of key influential champions in the media industry to address the problem head on and lobby the platforms to intervene. Never accept limitations to free speech. And this is where we need to be very careful because when we sound the alarm bells on fake news and disinformation. We sound the alarm bells across the country, and we sound the alarm bells for people who are attempting to fix it. If the solution that they're going to propose to us is legislation that would regulate our speech, then that cannot be acceptable. We should never accept any limitations to free speech and freedom of the press. The response should come from audiences, industry, and civil society. Many, in fact, would believe that this ship will write itself because it always does. Each new wave of technolo technological innovation and communication brings a flood of darkness. Then the public will eventually sniff out the bad stuff and demand the good stuff. This is the key, creating a demand for real, truthful, factual information. And to do this, offline institutions have to also get involved. Social media will continue to change for better or for worse. For better or for worse, it's here to stay. 
As users, we should assert our power in shaping the social media ecosystem. And as a news industry, we need to work together to figure out how to get our content to audiences and how to keep the demand for truthful information going. That's it for me. Thank you very much.